Inferential statistics is often the part of research methods that students dread, and there are a fair few complex terms that we're going to use in this video. But the statistics questions in the exam are often the ones that give you the most points for the least amount of writing, so definitely worth getting right. If you've completed the video series so far, we're going to use many of the ideas we've discussed already. These videos in particular go into depth on the knowledge we're going to apply to inferential statistics in this video. When it comes to answering questions in your exam papers, for AQA the only statistical test we need to calculate is the sign test, and I'll show you how to do that in this video. For the other seven tests we just need to know their names, and when to use them. So in this research methods video I'm going to show you a simple way of remembering when to use each statistical test, and I'll tell you how to show this knowledge off to the examiner. Psychboost.com, over 170 videos to help you with your qualification, and Patreon supporters can access bonus resources, tutorial videos, and the Discord channel. What are inferential statistics? So you'll likely start on this video without much of an idea of what the term inferential means. Well in the previous video we covered descriptive statistics. Those techniques, like measuring the central tendency or dispersion, summarise and describe raw data that researchers collect from the sample. Inferential statistics go beyond the sample, they generalise the results. In other words, they make inferences about the behaviour of the entire target population from the data collected from the sample. The question the researcher needs to ask is this. From the data collected from the sample, how confident am I that this data is strong enough to support my inference that the same behaviour is found in the target population? As we covered in the previous video, the researcher makes that decision on the basis of probability. If the likelihood of the results being due to chance is less than 1 in 20, phrased formally as p is less than 0 0.05, this arrow symbol means less than by the way, then the data collected from the sample is judged to be significant and accepted. The statistical tests are the tools that the researchers use to work out if the results are significant, and they use different tools depending on how they've structured their research study. Deciding which statistical test to use. In your exam when a stats question is asked, before the question you're highly likely to see a scenario, what we call a STEM. This STEM will probably outline a piece of research, and this STEM will provide you with all the clues you need to figure out which statistical test is needed for the stats question you're asked. You can see here I have an empty table. You're going to want to grab some paper and fill this out with me, because this table is how we're going to take all the clues given to you in the STEM and come up with the right statistical test to use and be able to justify to the examiner why we've chosen it. First thing we want to figure out is if the study is a correlation or a test of difference. A correlation is when the researcher just measures two covariables and looks for a relationship, so you're looking for words like correlation, relationship or association in the STEM. A test of difference simply means an experiment. The researcher is testing for a difference in the dependent variable as a result of manipulating the independent variable. If you think back to the experimental design video, you should remember independent groups design. The data we get from this design is known as independent data, because the groups are measured independently. You should also remember repeated measure design. The data we get from this design is called related data as each data point in one condition has a related data point in the other condition. There is also match pairs design. Now it's important to remember we treat data from match pairs, despite coming from separate groups, as related data, as each data point in one condition has a match data point in the other condition. Along the top of the table we have the levels of measurement, nominal data, data in categories, ordinal data, data that we can put in order, and interval data, where there's the same difference between each data point. We also treat ratio data as interval data in this table. The statistical test that we will use depends on the dependent variable's level of measurement, or in a correlation, the covariable with the lowest level of measurement. I'll fill a table with the names of each of the statistical tests. As you can see, each of the statistical tests is only appropriate for a particular combination of data, and it's your job to work out which one to use in an exam. So at first this might be a little overwhelming. With such a large number of unusually named statistical tests, but Quite frankly, we need to memorise this table, and actually if you write it out a few times from memory, it will go in. A good strategy is to make a phrase with the first letter of each statistical test, so S, W, R, C, M, U, C, S, P, and that for me is space weather really contains many UFOs chasing small pigs. That works for me. You might be able to think of one that works better for you, but the point is to get the right letters into the correct part of the table. Then we can write in sign test, Wilcoxon, related t-test, 
chi squared, Man Whitney, unrelated t test, chi squared again, Spearman's row, and Pearson's. So, to be clear on how this table works, if the study in the stem is a correlational study, the stats test to use will be one of the ones in the bottom row. If it's an experiment, also called a test of difference, then the test will be one of the ones on the top two rows. We can then narrow it down by figuring out the experimental design. If it's independent groups, so unrelated data, it will be one of the tests in the middle row. If it's repeated measures or matched pairs, the data is related data and the stats test used will be in the top row. Final decision we need to make is on the data collected. If it's nominal, the stats test we need, we found in the first column, ordinal the second and interval the third. Now you need to be able to sketch this table out very quickly to remind yourself which test to use or justify why a test was used. Both possible questions. Here's a quick sketch I made. After a couple of practice goes, it took me less than 30 seconds. And in an exam situation, when you're looking at a stats question that might be worth up to seven marks, 30 seconds to draw this in the margin is a really good investment to make sure you're picking the correct test. If we can figure out all of that from the stem, we should now have our stats test selected using the stats test table. So you should have your own stats test sketch to hand. Here are nine examples of studies. Pause the video and see if you can figure out which study goes with which statistical test. Think carefully about the language used in each example. Once you've done that, unpause the video and I'll walk you through each example. Number one, for this study, the researcher will use a Pearson's R. It's clearly a correlation and the data used for each covariable is at the interval level of measurement. Two, for this study, the researcher will use a chi-squared. The study is an experiment, so a test of difference. The researcher is using independent groups, so unrelated data. And the level of data used to measure the DV is category, so nominal. Three, for this study, the researcher will use a Spearman's row. This, again, is a correlation, and the data collected is at the ordinal level. Four, this is an unrelated t-test. A test of difference and unrelated data as independent groups are used. As it has unrelated in the name, this stats test is pretty easy to remember. The data collected is at the interval level. Five, Wilcoxon. This is a test of difference. It uses repeated measures, so is related data, and it's collected at the ordinal level. Six, a sign test. A test of difference, and again, it uses repeated measure design, so related data. But the data collected is in categories, so nominal data. Seven, a related t-test. As an experiment, it's a test of difference. It's related data as it's a match pairs design, and the data collected is of course at the interval level. Eight, a Mann-Whitney. It's a test of difference using an independent group's design, so unrelated data. The data collected is at the ordinal level. Finally, nine, for this study, the researcher will again use a chi-squared, this time for a correlation, but the data again is at the nominal level. So from that task, you should now be able to identify the stats test that needs to be used based on the details you're given in the exam. But you also need to be able to actually answer a stats test question in a way that will maximize your marks in the exam. Let me show you how we can do that. How to answer the stats question. A common question to ask after the STEM is, name an appropriate statistical test that could be used, justify your choice for marks. So using the skills we've just developed, we can take the clues given in the STEM and identify the test as a Mann-Whitney test. Now we've done the hard work, but only got one point so far. We have to justify why we've named the test. So this is likely one point for saying it's a test of difference, one point for saying it uses unrelated data, and a final point for saying the data is at the ordinal level. The question is sometimes phrased differently. The question could say the name of the test used and ask you to explain why this was a suitable test. Then we have to justify why the test was used in the same way. Keep in mind for these questions to get all of the marks, it may not be enough just to say it's a test of difference. You need to state clearly the levels of independent variable. If it's a correlation, give both covariables and explain the researcher was looking for a relationship between them. When stating that data is nominal, ordinal or interval, state exactly what scale was used in the study. I've seen these questions scored as high as seven marks, so it's well worth taking the time to contextualize your response to get them right. A more complex stats test question will ask us to work out if a test is significant or not. In this case, we'll see a critical values table, which again, looks a little intimidating. But really, with a bit of practice, they are fairly easy to use. Somewhere in the stem, it will state the calculated value worked out by the researcher. Your job is to compare this calculated value to the correct critical value in the critical value table. But how do you find it? 
Firstly, we need to work out the number of participants in the study. Again, this will be mentioned somewhere in the STEM. For some of the tests, something called degrees of freedom are used instead of participants, but again, it should give you this in the question or the STEM. Now we know the row, and we can ignore all of the other values in all of the other rows. Now we need to figure out the level of significance used. Well, if you remember from the probability video, it's likely 0 0.05. 0 0.01 is very occasionally used in replications or if the study is controversial. If the question wants you to use a 0 0.01 level, it should tell you. In fact, so far, I've never seen a question that didn't use a 0 0.05 level of significance. I'm not saying it can't happen, but I've not seen it. So, picking 0 0.05, we're now down to only two numbers. 0 0.05 for a one-tailed test and 0 0.05 for a two-tailed test. Thinking back to the hypothesis videos, you likely remember a one-tailed test is a directional hypothesis and a two-tailed test is non-directional. In this case, the hypothesis is directional. You should be able to work this out from the question. It's either going to tell you if it's directional or not, or it'll tell you it was based on previous research, which means the researcher is using a directional hypothesis. One final step. Under the critical value table, it'll tell you if the calculated value has to be equal or greater than, or equal and less than the critical value to be significant. In this case, our calculated value is greater than the critical value, so our data is not significant. Now, to complete the question, we need to write our answer in a way which shows to the examiner we've used all the steps required to reach our conclusion. And here's a template sentence that will help you structure your answer. As the observed calculated value, insert calculated value given here, is greater or less, select one of those, than the critical value, insert the critical value you found here, we must accept or reject the alternate hypothesis at p equals 0 0.05 or really unusually 0.01 for a, and then a one or a two-tailed test. This sentence will likely be worth a large number of points as you're effectively explained to the examiner why you came to a conclusion on the significance or not of the data. Working out degrees of freedom. Now it is possible if we're using a chi-squared test, AQA will ask you to work out the degrees of freedom, DF, before using that to read the critical value off the table. I've only seen this once so far and the question gave you the formula but I'm gonna quickly show you how to do it and it's pretty simple. This is a formula and this is the table we're gonna use it on. So degrees of freedom is simply the number of rows minus one times the number of columns minus one. We can now use this to find our critical value and complete the question. Calculating the sign test. The one and only statistical test that we can be expected to calculate is the sign test. Fortunately, once you know how to do it, it is super simple and won't require maths more complex than addition and subtraction. In an exam, you might be asked to complete the sign test from start to finish. I'm going to show you how to do that, but it's more likely you'll be asked to do part of the process like identifying N or S. Hopefully you remember from the grid, the researcher uses a sign test when they conduct a test of difference, so an experiment, not a correlation. The experimental design is either repeated measures or matched pairs so related data, and the level of measurement is at the nominal level. Here's a set of scores I've made up for a repeated measures experiment. So participants have completed both condition A and condition B. Here are the raw scores for each condition. The first step is to subtract the score in condition B from condition A. It actually doesn't matter which way around I do this. I could subtract condition A from B and the sign test would still work. So in the first row, it's nine subtract 11, that's minus two, and I'm gonna do exactly the same for each row. I now need to record the sign, positive or negative for each of those calculations. In the first row, it's negative, the second, no sign, so I'm gonna leave that blank, and on the third, positive, and so on. Now I can work out two really important numbers, N and S. N is the number of participants where there's a difference between the conditions. So that is simply counting up all the positives and negatives. In this data set, N is seven. And that's because there are five negatives and two positives. We can ignore the three participants who scored the same in each condition. S is the least frequent sign. So there are five negatives and two positives. So S is two. If you think about it, S is all the people in the study who didn't behave in the way expected by the hypothesis. And as you can probably guess, for the data in a study to be significant, this needs to be as few people as possible. With N and S, we can now find out if the data is significant or not using a critical value table. We do this using the process I showed you earlier in the video. Let's say from the question in the exam paper, I know this is a directional study and we're using a 0.05 level of significance. 
I'm looking down the first column as that has a 0 0.05 for a one tail test. I'm looking across at an n of 7. And the point where these intersect is my critical value. For the sign test, the critical value has to be equal to or less than the calculated value to be significant. Because my calculated value of s is 2, which is more than the critical value of 0, this means the data is not significant. The alternate hypothesis is rejected and the null is accepted. As you can see with such a small sample, with only 7 participants showing a difference between the conditions, s would have had to be 0 to be significant. And as you can see, as I include more people in the sample, the number of participants' behaviour going against the hypothesis can increase while keeping my results significant. I have 8 tutorial videos covering the AS and A-level research method sections from 2017 to 2020. These videos have worked example to every question and full of exam tips. Patrons at the neural level and above can access these, and many, many more hours of exam tutorial videos, as well as over 100 printable resources from across the A-level over on psychboost.com. I do want to thank all the students and teachers who have supported Psychboost over on Patreon during the development of the Research Method Unit. It's their support that allows me to teach part-time so I can make Psychboost on YouTube for everyone. I also want to give a special shout out to the patrons who support me at the developer level. So thanks to them, and I would say see you in the next Research Methods video, uh, but this uh, over one year epic of, of prep is done. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Right.